Hello, my name is Joanna Grace and I'm a sensory engagement and inclusion specialist and the founder of the Sensory Project. This workshop, Creating Sensory Accessibility, was created because I had so many requests from heritage workers asking what they could do to enhance sensory accessibility in their settings. So you might be accessing this workshop as a heritage worker, you might be accessing this workshop as a theatre producer or um, some sort of creative arts person. You might be a teacher, you might be somebody who works in a care setting, you might be the, a family member of somebody with a disability or a neurodivergence, or you could be an employer or a professional. You, you could be anybody, <laughs> but presumably you're somebody who's curious about sensory accessibility. And what we are going to be doing is asking questions and reflecting and thinking about the changes that we can make to enhance sensory access. Now, normally when people think about accessibility to places, to buildings, they think about um, ramps or toileting provision. And obviously those things are enormously important. But imagine I saw, I saw a photo once, it was a man in a wheelchair at the bottom of a flight of steps and at the top of the flight of steps was an opera house and inside the opera house was some amazing opera going on and the picture was taken from a long way off and you just saw this small figure and these enormous flight of steps and he had no access. You can have the best event. You can have, you know, inside that event, you can have something that is fully accessible. You know, that man could have enjoyed the opera, but if you don't provide access, then there's no point. And to stretch that metaphor quite a bit, um, I was once presenting on a panel with Tani Gray Thompson, the Olympic athlete and Lord, lady, sorry, <laughs> Lord and lady. Um, and she was talking about having to be carried up flights of stairs when she was part of the Olympic Committee. And she talked about having to pull herself up flights of stairs, how she as a young child learned to climb out of her wheelchair, crawl up the steps and drag it behind her. You know, so there are people who can get in. But imagine you know, the man in the wheelchair at the fo foot of the opera house steps. If he climbs up, if he gets himself out of his chair and drags, does he really enjoy the opera as much as he might have done if there was a ramp? There are people who are accessing our performances and our events and our settings and our classrooms and our day rooms and all of these things. There are people who are accessing them, who can get themselves in, but who still don't get as much out of it as they might have done because sensory access wasn't provided. So. I invite you to watch the coming films. Each one is a short film. I aim to speak for no more than 10 minutes at a trot. I'm not very good at sticking to time, but I do plan, I've got a cunning plan on this one, to pop some short films in at the end. So I'm hoping to average about 10 minutes per piece. And then you'll find in your workbooks, you've got tasks and activities and challenges. All of those things are optional. They are to invite you to engage with this material. You can do that in whatsoever way you wish and whatsoever way works best for you. But what I would really love is for you not to watch them all in one go because you get more out of it. I know we live in a culture of binge watching television and I am guilty of that myself. But if you watch just one and then let it rattle around in your brain, you will get more out of it because I'm not giving you the answers here. I'm giving you the questions and the answers will be unique to your particular situation, to the people involved in that situation, to who you're trying to invite and what you're trying to do. So it would be really foolish of me to sit here and give you the answers because if I give you one set of answers that will work one time. So it's questioning. It's not really the bit about me talking that is the training. It's you thinking. You're doing the training to yourself. So please take the time between the films to stop and pause and reflect and have a look around and have a smell around and have a touch around and really think about these ideas. I hope you enjoy the shorts.
This short is about creating cognitive accessibility using sensory strategies. Now, you might be a heritage worker whose job it is to share the stories of the amazing place that you work in. You might be a theatre producer who's going to tell a love story on stage, or you could be a teacher looking to explain the science curriculum to your students. Or maybe you're a member of a care team and you want to explain to one of the people who lives in your setting that they're going to have to go to hospital. Or maybe you're a family member and your family has recently experienced a bereavement and you want to explain to the person, to your loved one, you know, where, where grandma has gone. You know, to do these things, you need words. You know, I need to tell you the history of this place. I need to describe the passion in this love story. I need to explain the science. I need to let you know what's going to happen when you get to hospital. I need to tell you that grandma has died. And you also need the person that you're sharing that information with to have an understanding, to be capable of taking in those words and connecting them to the meaning behind them and then appreciating what that means and putting them away into their memory so that they remember that amazing story that you shared with them or they understand what's going to happen next. But do you? You know? Meaning is not a word-based thing. It's something words talk about. And an experience has value in the now, whether it's remembered or not. So sensory experiences can convey meaning, just like music can convey meaning, or contemporary dance can convey meaning. There is meaning in taste, in smell, in touch, in sound, in sights. And so... For the heritage workers, the people who lived in that place, trod those sunken steps, smelt the honeysuckle in bloom over the door in the warm summer evenings. The theatre lovers, they, the people attending that performance, can feel the pounding heartbeat of the lovers. They can feel their bodies sway to the music that they dance to. To the teacher... Gravity was explained to Newton by the sight of an apple falling, by the sound of its thud, by the impression, the feel of it on his skull. You can experience the meaning of these things. To the care team, when that person goes to hospital, they will experience a set of sensory experiences that are unfamiliar to them. Gloved rubber hands will touch them, antibac gel smells will fill the air, Bandages will wrap around their limbs. These are sensations you can explain beforehand. You can't protect them from what's going to happen, but you can make it a lot less frightening in its familiarity. And to the family, you bring grandma to life in your words. You share your memories of her. You talk about her and keep her legacy alive in your life through that sharing of meaning. But she's there in sensory memories too. She's the feel of her clothes, the smell of her soap. She's the music she loved listening to. And you can share those sensory connections with somebody else. And they're valuable to everybody. So there's absolutely value in doing this. I was asked to write a book chapter for Dr Nicola Grove for her um, stories book. And she asked me to write about the sensory stories I write about scientific topics. And she challenged me and she said, you know, there's some people, Joe, who will say that there isn't any point in teaching science to people who don't have cognitive access to what's being described in these theories and things. And you think, well, if you follow that argument through to its logical conclusion, then the only people we should teach science to are those with the cognitive capacities to do it. And I, you know... I don't think that's me, and I really enjoyed my science lessons. You know, I, I read the, A Brief History of Time when it first came out, and I pretty much understood it, but I had to go through some of the sentences quite a few times. You know, if the argument is we should only teach things to the cognitively able, I think a lot of us would 
come out of education pretty quickly. If the argument is that there is value to knowing these things, to sensing these things, to touching, I enjoyed not understanding that book. I like the wonder of not knowing, the appreciation of how small I am in the universe. And these are all experiences that can be shared in a sensory way. So sensation can provide access to meaning. And if you're going to try and do that, then you need to think about what those sensations might be. So I talk on the Sensory Stories course, and if you are um, a heritage worker looking to share the stories of a setting, it's a good course for you. I talk on the Sensory Stories course about how I judge the richness of a sensory experience and the relevance. And the relevance is obviously, it's got to be relevant to the situation. So it's no good if you're taking a person to a hospital and you've given them the smell of the antibac gel that you use in your setting and then you pop up at the hospital and they're using a completely different brand that smells in a completely different way. There was no use to that. And there's no point in sharing somebody else's old clothes if you're trying to talk about grandma. You need grandma's clothes. Clearly, the sensations need to be relevant to the experience. But they also need to have sensory appeal. They need to be rich sensory experiences in and of themselves. And what I mean by that is that they hold appeal to the sensory systems alone. So if you remove cognition, are your eyes still interested in looking at that thing? You know, if I held up my notes, here you go, you might be interested, you would look, because you understand that those little squiggles contain meaning. So your eyes will be drawn to text in the same way your eyes will be drawn to pictures because you understand that pictures tell stories. It's not your eyes, it's your brain. Your brain is going, oh, there's information there. There's information there. What if your brain didn't do that? Then where would your eyes go? You know, have a think. Question yourself. What are my senses interested in? And challenge yourself to go and experience, you know, if you are the heritage worker, go and experience that building and think about it at a sensory level. Try and disengage your cognition and just feel it. And the same, if you're taking the person to hospital, you know why. There's a lot of meaning in that, that actually they might not need explaining to them. What they need to understand is what those moments are going to be like. Because if you're somebody who lives without access to a working memory, somebody who can't lay down memories or whose memories get destroyed by epilepsy firing through their brain, if you're somebody who can't anticipate a future, you live in a present moment. And what you need to know is what those moments ahead of you are going to be like. And if you're somebody who's been bereaved, you've lost moments from the past. And having a little bit of them back can connect you. It's the same thing that we all do, isn't it? When we talk about our lost loved ones, it's upsetting. But it's not upsetting because we're talking about them. It's upsetting because they're gone. And as we talk about them, that's how we process that emotion. And there is no level of disability, sadly, that you can get to that protects you from bereavement. So although sharing those sensations with somebody might cause upset, it can also be a way of them processing and recognising that that person is gone. These clothes are empty. The smell is on a bar of soap, not on the hands of somebody I once knew. There is an absence here. And you're meeting that absence and holding space around it and connecting through it. So sensory experiences can contain meaning and convey meaning and count just as much as words. And when we offer sensory meaning within our settings, within our performances, within our instruction, within our care, with, you know, in whatever one of these contexts, not only do we support people who can't access these things through other means, but we also make it a deeper, more connected experience for everyone. It has value across the board, regardless of ability, disability or neurodivergence. So go on a sensory adventure and explore your landscape. In the first film, I talked about how using sensory experiences 
can support cognitive access to a place or a topic or some information. And in this film, I'm going to talk about how to support accessibility through backgrounding sensory experiences. The background that you provide to a sensory experience can destroy the most amazing sensory experience you have. And the background that you provide to a sensory experience can raise up quite a mediocre sensory experience to be something awe-inspiring. So I'll give you an example. If I want to show you, I'm just reaching around the room here, you know, this little red candle, and I show it to you against the background of my clipboard, that is not visually accessible, is it? I could show it to you against the background of the wall, that's quite plain, and that is more accessible because you've got a contrast of colour there. Another thing that's good to notice about the wall is that it's a matte tone. If that was a shiny wall, you'd, you'd wonder why I was in a shiny room, say it was a glass window or some perspex or something like that. Although to us, it might appear to be a clear visual presentation, it's very likely that for somebody with different visual capacities, the reflected light would cause a confusing pattern because they wouldn't just be seeing the plane of the backdrop, they'd be seeing the light of the window reflected in it and the shape of another object and, and all of those things. So looking for a matte colour tone is a good thing to do when you're considering a visual background, looking for a contrasting colour tone. And then it's also interesting to think about that sight is the processing of light by the retina. And white colours, bright colours, throw off a lot more light than darker tone colours. And so although this looks nice and visually accessible to you, somebody who can access information on a screen, um, possibly the light colour is asking more of a person. You know, I'm asking them to process all of this light here and also search out that little blob. Whereas if I had it against a dark colour, let's just see if I can use my sleeve, can you see actually, I think it shows up on the screen that it's a bit easier on the eye to look at it there. It's harder, it's the brighter surround places a greater pressure on it. I don't know if you'll be able to see that. I have um, quite um, high visual processing. So to me that makes a difference, but it might not to you. But a dark matte background, probably a natural tone in a contrasting color is great for visual access. and. You know, the clothes that you wear are part of the experience. Where you hold the object is part of the experience. So me holding it over there is very different from me holding it here is very different from me holding it here. So consider your own clothing if you're the person, you know, if you're working at a heritage setting and you're handling an object or if you're showing somebody something in hospital that you're about to, you know, you might show somebody an instrument that you're about to use on them. Will that instrument stand out against your gown that you're wearing? Could you have, you know, a conveniently coloured clipboard to hand to offer that visual presentation so that you could explain it at a sensory level? And then if you're looking to engage somebody in a visual experience, there's a couple of more things you can do to add interest. So one is you can add movement because we have two types of sensors in our eyes. We have ones for shape and colour and we have ones for movement. So when I hold this here, your shape and colour sensors are saying, oh, round and red. And if I do this, now your movement sensors are going, oh, there's something there too. So I've doubled the information coming to your brain. And notice I just did a little jiggle like this. I didn't do this business. This business is a much, much higher level skill involving the anticipation of where that object is going, a storing of that information in memory, a predicting of that information into the future. So just a little wiggle. A little wiggle will give you some interest that will attract my visual attention. You think if you were sitting in a quiet room doing some reading and something just a little wiggle, that would draw the attention of your vision. And that's what we were talking about in the first film, that it's about the attention of the senses, regardless of cognition. That's when you know you're getting it really right. So that was an example from sight. With sound, <laughs> do you know, Simon and Garfunkel recorded some of their first songs in the stairwell of their school building because the sound echoed about the place. And I'm sitting in quite an echoey room now, and if I was to pan the camera down, you'd see that I'm sitting in a pile of cushions to try and make up for that. 
So you're thinking about, it's the same thing as this visually, isn't it? You're thinking, here's the sound that I'm making. What is the background to this sound? Is it a stairwell that's going to bounce it around and make it sound like I'm singing with a choir of other voices all my own? Or is it a background that will allow this sound to be presented on its own to a person's ear? So think about, you know, I'm sitting here in all the cushions. Think about the use of soft furnishings. Think about having heavy curtains. Think about using um, screens as dividers. Even just, you know, corrugated cardboard works very well to insulate sound. Egg boxes are a classic, aren't they? But those, um, you know, those display boards, I'm thinking of the people working in the heritage settings again now, or the teachers, those display boards that have like padded foam and carpet on them that people stick notices to. They're wonderful as sound screens. And also think about the floor. You know, Nora Jones might want to wake up with the rain falling under a tin roof. But I once tried to write a book in a room with a tin roof and it rained and it's it's not a calming noise. And if your flooring is really hard and you've got the clip clop clopping of lots of high heeled shoes going across it and then the trainers scrunching across it, you've put a lot of sound into your environment that probably isn't anything to do with what you're communicating. And this is where I was saying in the first one, your sensory experiences convey meaning. So as well as conveying the meaning of, you know, the lovely historical object, the love story, the hospital visit, we'd want to make sure that we're not cluttering up that meaning with other information. I'm giving you meaning in a verbal format currently. Imagine if there were three other voices playing over this. How much of my meaning would you be able to pick up? So think about the whole background to that experience. So I've done sight and I've done sound. Smell would be the next one that I would come to because it's the only sense processed by the limbic brain. So it pass passes. That's not the right word. It I was going to say punch, pax, pax is the right word. You can't really pass somebody a punch, can you? It packs a huge emotional punch because it's your emotional brain that deals with smell. So if you're asking somebody to focus, but there's a strong smell in that environment, that will pull them away. It, it sort of tugs at your heartstrings, as it were, and it can cause disgust, it can cause fear, it can cause um, somebody to jump around in their memories to another place and another time. It's very distracting. So to consider a background experience, if you are presenting a smell, you want a nice fresh air environment, you want the windows cracked open, you want a good ventilation system, you want to make sure that if you're working in a big building, the, the air conditioning systems that you have don't pump random smells from other parts of the building into where you are. I've been to um, some galleries where, you know, like suddenly in one room you get the smell of the toilets. Um, I've been to a theatre where if you sat in one of the particular stands, the, it must have had like the vents from the kitchen coming through. So you'd smell all of the um, prep. It wasn't even their kitchen. It was the restaurant next door. You'd smell all of that wafting through. And, you know, it's nice to smell bacon cooking or curry spices frying, but it's not particularly relevant to the theatre performance that you're watching. If you are offering smell as a sensory experience, as a part of how you're engaging people with this topic, be careful not to do too much unless it's necessary. You know, if they're going to be having a medical procedure and there's going to be lots of different smells like the antibac, maybe the iodine, um, the rubber of things, these all have different smells, then there's a, there's a reason to be offering multiple smells. But if you're offering smell as a way of engaging somebody with a performance or with a piece of history, then keep it, you know, one or two smells is enough because you don't want to be asking too much of a person and it's very easy to overwhelm people with smell. So think about the background, have fresh air and, and don't, please don't just put a smell on in a room and subject everybody to it, whether they opt in or opt out. That's, that's not very friendly. That's, that's like, you know, if somebody walked into your space and just put their music on, there's no choice. You, you have to allow a choice to engage with these experiences and not. And you don't have a lot of choice when it comes to smell because you have to breathe. With sight, I can always close my eyes. With sound, I can put my fingers in my ears. But to escape smell, 
I would have to stop breathing and that's not fair to expect me to do that if you're if that's my only option. So we've done sight, we've done sound, we've done smell. Taste, taste is broadly the same as smell because most of our experience of taste comes from the smell of our food, not the flavours. However, it is a very distracting sense because our senses at a fundamental level are all about us finding food and not becoming food. And if we've got food, then we're very happy about it and we want to think about it. So a taste in your mouth is likely to distract you from what's going on around you because it's the best thing. Um, it holds an enormous amount of interest. So if you are telling stories or creating, you know, performances and you can offer a taste that's relevant and a nice taste, you know, one that people enjoy, you'll get so much interest for that. So it's worth using carefully, judiciously, and just be mindful that you don't want um, somebody to be trying, like if you're the heritage worker, don't tell them all about the wonderful piece of history as you've sat them down in the cafe to enjoy their avocado on toast. So I've done sight, sound, smell, taste. So touch, touch is an interesting one to consider because it's always competing against a background of sensation. Our touch organ is our skin. And so I am currently touching the floor with the soles of my feet, the chair with the backs of my legs, my clothing, and all of this is giving information to my brain. So if you want to give me a sensory experience that stands out to my tactile sense, it needs to be something in contrast to what I'm feeling so far. It's back to that example I was giving with the little tea light earlier on. This is my background what's the contrast to it going to be? So what will you offer me that feels different, that interests my sense, that draws the attention of my sense? Go around your setting and touch things. What stands out to you? I sometimes do a test to myself. I imagine myself on the tube. And when you're on the tube, you have to maintain a yeah, a blank expression and a mid-distance stare of contempt for humanity. <laughs> If my hand were to brush against something fabric, I'm not going to flick it from that. It's probably just somebody's coat. It's not of interest. If my hand brushed against something sort of wet and sticky, because that stands out in such contrast to what I'm currently experiencing within my own clothing and what I expect to experience within that environment, I'd look. It would draw the attention because it has that contrast appeal. So go around, touch things, feel things, smell things, taste things. Think about how you can create physical accessibility through the senses by backgrounding sensory experience within your setting. And then by doing that, hopefully, you will create the background that raises mediocre experiences up to an awe-inspiring and just rockets the amazing experiences, you know, out of this world. In this short, we're going to be thinking about creating sensory accessibility to the experience itself. So you've got the gorgeous sensory resource that's going to attract the attention of the senses. You've created the perfect background to that resource so that it's raised up to its, you know, awe-inspiring brilliance. Well, what next? Are you just giving one moment of context? one moment of meaning or is there a next it's most likely that there is this is probably something that comes in a sequence you know the love story that the theater people are making there's there's the meeting and there's the heartbreak and there's the getting back together the heritage setting story there's a story there isn't there they lived here they did this um this is who lived here next uh, you can tell i haven't visited as many heritage settings as i have theaters um, the teacher, there's a narrative, there's, in all of these experiences, something happens next. So you've got your great sensory experience and you've got the next great sensory experience. And ha whatever piece of meaning you're conveying, this is a sequence of sensory experiences. And how are we going to make this accessible? Because just having these experiences can be a bit overwhelming. People will need extra information in order to be able to orientate themselves to what's going on. 
So when it first happens to them, these this succession of these amazing, awe-inspiring sensory experiences happens to them, and it's a bit like, oh my goodness, what's this? I've not experienced this before. It's a bit overwhelming. And when you're shocked like that, you don't take in everything. So what you need to do is plan for repetition. How are you going to enable this person to have that experience again? Are they going to come back next week? Is the ticket a ticket that allows you 10 visits to the show? Or is there a way that they can tell the story of the show afterwards? How many times before they go to hospital are you going to talk about what's going to happen to them in hospital? And I say talk, which indicates words, but I mean talk in a sensory language. And with grandma, do we just say once? That she's gone and expect that to be enough or do we need to have that conversation multiple times so we need a sequence of sensory experiences and we need to plan to repeat that so for a heritage setting that might mean that you put up on your website a little bit of information about how people can create the experiences you're going to give them when they visit you ahead of time or it might be that you give them a little kit that means that they can repeat them afterwards. And this having the opportunity to connect enables people to get more out of that experience. It can help when we're thinking about these things to consider the opposite, what it would be like to not be connected to that experience, to not understand what was going on. So I can give you an example in your own life of you having felt panicked and disconnected as a result of a lack of sensory experience and that is just on the boundaries of sleep just as you're waking up or falling asleep have you ever felt like you're falling that <gasps> sudden moment and what that is is actually it's one of your subconscious sensory systems which I'm not mentioning too much in in this workshop but if you're interested in finding out about some of your extra senses, then have a look at my Develop Your Sensory Lexiconry course, especially the Super Lex. Um, but what, what happens to you in that moment where you feel like you're falling is your proprioceptive sense, which is your sense that gives you your awareness of where your body is in space, either falls asleep slightly before you or wakes up slightly after you. And when you don't have sensory information about where you are in the world, <gasps> that's a very frightening thing. And if people are experiencing these wonderful sensory experiences that you've got for them, but not doing that in a connected way, it can be a very frightening and disorientating thing. And the other place that's good for a reference point is places where we feel overwhelmed. So I mentioned doing a test about being on the tube earlier. Quite often, an environment like that, a high-pressured public transport lots of stressed people around, lots of noise, lots of smells, lots of hustle and bustle. That's overwhelming for a lot of people. And so what we actively try and do in those situations is zone out of it. You'll look around and you'll see people reading books, listening to music, far away look in your eye because you're trying to get out of that unpleasant overload in that sensory world. Being connected to the sensations around you, understanding what they are and being able to process those successfully helps you to feel embodied in the world, helps you to feel like you are here now. And actually feeling like you're here now is almost the opposite to anxiety. Because when you're anxious, you're worrying about something that's not now. You're headspace is full up of something else. It's not connected to now. Hopefully your now is somewhere where you are safe and secure and there's lots of interesting and lovely sensory experiences to have. And that's what we want for the experience that we're offering or for the narrative that we're bringing, for the information that we're providing. We want physical accessibility to that experience through the senses. And that happens by planning what those sensory experiences are, sequencing them, and then repeating them. Because the first time it happens, it's a big deal. The next time it happens, it's not such a big deal. The next time it happens, there are flickers of curiosity there. The next time it happens, 
those little flickers of curiosity fan into flames. The next time it happens, those flames of curiosity become engagement. The next time it happens, that engagement becomes interest. And then you've got, you've got them. They're there in that experience, living it, connected to it, enjoying it, understanding it, processing it. And then in time, it will drop off again. But in order to give that access, you need to plan for repetition. At the end of the last film, I said that you need to plan for repetition. And coming up in this film, I hope you'll find some ideas that connect to that. There are a couple of other films, not by me, that I would like you to watch as a part of this film. So you have the links to those in your workbook and you also have a live link to them on the associated Facebook photo album, which you've also got a link to in your workbook and you should have had a link to in your enrolment email. So you might want to pause me now and just go and set up those two other films so that maybe they're in different browser tabs so that you can pop across to them when I say go now. OK, so if I just do a pause face, ready? Hopefully that's given you time to set those films up. If, if you haven't, don't worry, you'll find them as we go along. But what we're thinking about in this film is physical accessibility in terms of our entrance to an experience. Now, in the very first of my sequence of films here, in the introduction, I told you about the picture that I'd seen of the man in a wheelchair at the foot of the steps in front of the opera house. And clearly what he needs is a ramp. And I'm just wondering if there's a way of over extrapolating that metaphor again, because a ramp is a graded thing, isn't it? There's a little bit and then a bit more and a bit more. And for some people who have sensory differences or uh, increased need to be orientated in the sensory world, coming from one environment into a very contrasting environment can be too much. You know, that contrast between the sensory familiarity of your first environment and the dramatic change in the second place. And I'm thinking of who you might be again. So if you are the heritage worker, the building that you work in is probably very different from the building that this person lives in. If you're the theatre performer, you're trying to make a space that is novel and unusual and different. If you're the teacher, maybe not so much for you, but it depends. Hopefully your lessons will be, you know, so spectacular that they do feel a bit out of the ordinary. If you're the care worker preparing somebody to go to hospital, that hospital environment is very different. So there are situations that we're talking about where we're expecting somebody to go from an environment that they're familiar with to an environment that they are unfamiliar with. And we want them to enter that unfamiliar environment. So this isn't about what's happening in that space. It's not about the background to what's happening in that space. It's not about anything that is beyond that door. It's about how we get from here into that place. How do we enter? And <laughs> I was just thinking, I was saying that it might be somebody who has a particular need. That what, what can happen is that if you just take somebody into that space, they can become very distressed. And sometimes they will manifest that distress through behaviours that you can see, through communicative behaviours that explain their distress. But oftentimes people will just shut down, zone out and not interact, not get access. You'll have physically brought them into the space, but you won't have provided access. So there's a difference between just bums on seats and actually meaningfully being invited and belonging in that space. And that's not because they have a learning disability or a physical disability or a neurodivergent condition. It's because they're human. We all react with distress when we are asked to enter unfamiliar sensory experiences. And the film, the first film that I set up for you is a really clear example of that. So I'd like you to go and watch that one now. Go on. Okay, hopefully you've done it now. Um, th that's top level scientists. 
that are responding like that. That's not people who struggle with their understanding of the world. That's not people who don't know what's going on in that space. They know perfectly well what that space is for. And yet, because at a sensory level, it's so dramatically different to what they're used to, they respond with very high levels of distress. And isn't that interesting? Because actually at the start, we were saying, here's a sensory way to give access to cognition, to meaning. But even with cognition, we still need to be given that access. Because we can understand it for all we like, but if our senses flag up danger, that beats any understanding. And if you imagine a gradation between those people who can understand it completely and those people who can't understand it at all, there's a whole range of needs within that gradation. Is it my ramp again? No, I'm, I'm overstretching that metaphor, definitely. So we're looking at how we provide for that. So how could you provide for that? You could... What, what do you need to know before you go to a place? For a lot of people, they just need a picture of what it's going to look like. That might be, you know, the little flyer that you put out that shows a shot of the performance and a blurb. And they go, oh, yeah, that's a theatre environment and it's a show and I know what to expect. And I know what to expect on a sensory level from that. They might check a photo of a restaurant before they go and they can imply from that information what it's going to feel like in that space. They might not be thinking that that's what they're doing, but at some level that is what they're doing. Maybe you need a bit more than that. So some settings offer a video tour to let people see what somewhere's going to be like before they go. And I, I was talking about that gradation of people. Of course, different people are different at different times. So I myself am neurodivergent and generally I don't need provision beyond just looking at a picture and knowing where I'm going you know I like to know the dress code to a party but beyond that I, I don't have a high level of need except for times when I'm likely to be stressed or I'm likely to have my resources used up on other things or to use the um, community language my spoons would have been used up elsewhere and if you don't know about spoon theory go and find I'll put a link in the workbook um, so, for example, when I had my little baby, I have an eight month old baby boy at the moment, I asked the birthing centre where I planned to give birth to him whether they could show me what the space looked like before I went. And they said, oh, yes, yes, we've got photos up on our website. There you go. I was like, yeah, but like they're lovely shot photos of what the birthing room would look like if we lit candles and spread rose petals around. I need to know what my route from the car looks like. I need to know what type of curb is there. I need to know what the doors look like. I need to know I need to know the route down the squatty bit of the hospital before I get to the lovely birthing suit so that I know what's going to happen to me. Because if I know, then that takes the anxiety away. If I didn't know, then I would be having one more thing to worry about and that would be one more spoon used at a time when I need all my spoons. And they were lovely. One of the junior midwives just filmed the route as she got out of her car one morning and walked into the building. And it was interesting because she went past the coffee station for the other nurses. There was a nose board. There was lots of things that would have pulled on my senses as I went past them and distracted me had I not known they were going to be there. So for a lot of people, just giving information and maybe giving a little bit extra information because we none of us mind being too prepared for something can really help. So it could be information, a photo, a blurb, it could be a video tour, but could it be more than that? Could it be a sensory tour? And I've actually worked um, with some heritage settings and some lovely um, nature places to do sensory tours. Um, I'm working with Exeter University at the moment to do a, not a sensory tour, but a sensory introduction to kayaking. So I'll put a link um, in your workbooks to a photo album that shows a lovely sensory tour of Heligan Gardens that was created by the people who worked there after they'd attended one of my sensory story training days. And that's your link to the previous film. That's the content that they were offering and they've offered it in a way that plans for repetition. And I spoke to them after they'd run the tour and they originally made it for people with learning disabilities and they said everybody wanted to go on it 
because of course everybody finds the sensory world interesting. But I'm going to refer you to my next little video, I'll do my pause face for you again, and this will show you a sensory accessibility um, story that I created to help somebody go to the circus. So go and watch that now. I'm trusting you this time because you went and watched last time. So you can see in that, because Rosa had the chance to smell the grass, to know that as you go through the flaps of the tent, the, the visual landscape changes colour, to be hit by that waft of popcorn smell, because she knew all of those things were going to happen, she was better able to cope with them when they happened on the day. And that gave her access, that gave her her entrance to the circus. And then the circus could present her with all the, you know, wonderful, extravagant performance that they had planned for her. I'm going back to my ramp again. Gradation is a really interesting thing. There's gradation in the rehearsing because Rosa could practice those experiences in a small way and build up to going to the circus. But actually, you could plan for a graded entry in a different way. So I met an architect once who had won an award for designing a cinema. And he designed this amazing grass roofed, mud constructed cinema, all natural resources and groovy eco credentials. And one of the things that he'd done was he'd said, you know, when you walk into a cinema, you go from light to dark so quickly. And when you first walk in, it's a bit disorientating because you know there are people there in the darkness who can see you because their eyes have already adjusted to the light. But you have that moment when you go through the swing doors and somebody's just taken your ticket, when you're thinking, I ought to be walking to my seat, but everybody's looking at me and I can't see them. And it's just a slightly little panicky moment that we're all used to if we go to the cinema. And then coming out, you've had that amazing time in that dark space and you suddenly come out into the lights and it's all a bit like, boom, real world hits you back again. And so what he did was he created a long tunnel that had I think he had lights in the roof and it got further or they got smaller. Whatever it was, you just walked down this tunnel and as you went down the tunnel, it very, very gradually became darker. So that as you walked into the space, when you got into the space, your eyes were accustomed to the darkness. And as you came out of the space, your eyes were eased out of that space. So he's done a visual gradation to provide access. So you could think about how it is when people come into your setting you could offer choices some people might like the big wow of the dramatic change the you know lifting up the tent flaps and going oh my goodness isn't this different smell the popcorn look at the colors but other people might prefer the option of that graded access so you could look at mapping the sensory landscapes you could look at creating graded points of access and i have popped links in your workbook to organizations who explore this in more detail so i hope you find them useful I said at the start that I was going to try and pop in some shorter films to compensate for any overruns. I think I've been doing quite well at sticking to my 10 minute goal, but this is one of my hopes for a shorter film. I'm just looking at what I'm hoping to say and thinking it might not be as short as I planned. So forgive me if I go back on previous promises, but I hope you'll enjoy it anyway. In this film, I'm going to be looking at sensory accessibility for ability within your setting. So. People might be coming to you to have the amazing experience of history, they might be coming to you to have an amazing theatre experience, they might be coming to you to learn, they might be living in your setting, they might be, you know, all these reasons. You have some point to why you're looking at this um, topic. But within that, so let's just pick one. Let's pick the heritage workers, because they were the people who gave me the kick up the bottom to create this course. Um, if I'm coming to your historic castle. I'm coming to learn about how the people lived in the olden days and to smell their food and to touch the tools that they used. But whilst I'm there, I'm going to be, you know, walking around or wheeling around. I might have some food. You know, I'm going to be doing lots of practical things myself. And how you lay out your setting can enable or disable me at a sensory level. 
So I'm going to give you some examples. I, I'm not going to go through every permutation of things that people might do or every option that you have for supporting people. Because like I said in the introduction, these are so many permutations and there aren't answers, there are questions. And these aren't really questions, these are just like springboard ideas. So, for example, if I'm going to eat and I'm going to use cutlery, am I going to be able to see the cutlery? You know, is it shiny cutlery that reflects the light and sometimes looks like other things and sometimes looks like cutlery? Is it cutlery with a bold coloured handle? Does that bold coloured handle stand out from the table behind it? What about my food? Is my food on a white plate or a black plate? Is it on a matte plate? You know, are there ways that you can make eating more accessible to me? I have a photo that I share on Facebook from time to time and I'll try and pop a link to it or pop it in. Let's just put it in the workbook. It's of my dining room table and it's the chairs around my dining room table. Have a look at it now. Can you see which chair is easier to sit down on from a sensory point of view? The one chair I can see and reach for myself, the other chair I might be confused about. And actually this is something that I've done in care homes that are supporting elderly residents. A lot of people struggle with their sensory processing as they get older, myself included. I used to be able to thread the needle on my sewing machine and now, now to thread the needle on my sewing machine, I have to use my knowledge of backgrounding sensory experience. If I hold a little piece of white paper behind the needle, then I can see to thread it, but I can no longer see to thread the needle with the confusion of the background behind it. But the way you set up the environment in which I eat can be the difference for me between being able to feed myself and be an independent person and needing help. And also, where am I eating? Because I, I'm a big research geek and I really love reading the research around sensory engagement and around people with complex disabilities and neurodivergent conditions. And oftentimes there's a dearth of that research or I'm reaching into fields that are not my own and hoping to pick out relevant morsels of information. But this is one of the places where we've actually got a lot of knowledge because the gastro chefs have looked into the interaction between the senses when we eat. And it's things like the texture of the tablecloth between our fingertips changes the sensation of the ice cream on our tongue. The sounds in the room alter the sharpness of the wine as we drink it. What we see, all of these things interact. If you want to create a space where people are really going to enjoy their food, think about it at a sensory level and think about how those different interact. Like if you want to design a place where people are definitely not going to enjoy their food, your average school dining hall is probably it. What you want is a loud echoey room with lots of chairs that scrape on the floor and lots of like clunks of big trays of cutlery being put down and dumped and you throw in the occasional smash of a glass or something and you can be sure that your food's going to taste pretty awful. So, you know, think about the sensory landscape. It can be used for more than just your, the, the main event and the background to that event and the access to that event. You can enable people within their experience of all of those things. Um, I did some work in a, a setting for people with dementia and quite often what happens when you get to later age is that you struggle with your sensory processing or you'll have little blips. So a common experience is for somebody to have a fall and this is to do with one of your subconscious sensory systems, which I'm sort of not supposed to be talking about in this workshop, because I, I told myself at the start I was just going to focus on the famous five, but um, it's, it's like gateway drugs. Once you start off into the subconscious senses, it's very easy to collect more and more of them. Um, I'll, I normally stick to seven, so I've mentioned proprioception, so it's okay if I do vestibulation. Vestibulation is your sense of motion and balance. It's what informs you of whether you're you know tilting a bit this way tilting a bit that way and that enables you to right yourself and to balance and to move along and it's essential for movement and quite often when people are older they'll have a little fall and the problem that happens when people have a little fall is that they get very worried about having another one and so they concentrate on balancing 
but your balance is meant to be done subconsciously. And when you concentrate on doing it, you take it out of the subconscious mind into the conscious mind, which isn't really very well practiced at doing it. And then you're more likely to have another little fall. You think about yourself, if you were to try and balance along a beam, you wouldn't concentrate on balancing, would you? You'd concentrate on looking. You'd fix your eyes on a point at the end and you'd walk that way. And it's that partnering of your sense of sight with your sense of balance, your vestibular sense, that supports you in staying upright and staying on the beam. And so what we did in this um, setting was the residents all lived along a long corridor and the breakfast room was at the end of the corridor. And we wanted to support people in their ability to walk independently down this corridor. And so all we did was we put a little shelf in at the end of the corridor and we made sure there was a big bunch of, of red flowers on that shelf. And the, behind that shelf was just a plain wall. So as you come out of your bedroom door, you look down to see the new flowers for the day. You think, oh, those flowers are nice. And those flowers, that shelf was at eye height, you know, so those flowers are over there. And you look at the flowers and you walk down the hall and then here's the door to the breakfast room and you can... It, it supported their ability to balance and walk. You can also do a lot to, in the opposite direction, I went to a hotel once that had vertically striped carpet on the stairs. I've never struggled so much. I, I mentioned I have hypervisual processing. Oh my, I, the only way I could walk up those stairs was to not look at them and just trust that I had a muscle memory in my legs that understood how to do steps. And when you're carrying, you know, I was carrying a heavy object today, I would be carrying a baby if I was trying those stairs. You can support or you can destroy. It's the same thing. So we're thinking about enabling skills and we're also looking at a person's ability to focus. So we're back to what you might be, what's your sort of main purpose of doing this, the story that you're telling or the information that you're conveying. You want somebody to be able to pay attention to that. And some people will need more information in order to be able to orientate themselves to that experience. And some people will need less stimulation in order to be able to cope with that experience. So let's think about the people who need more information to orientate themselves to the experience. And I realise I haven't done a very good job at promising under 10 minutes, have I? Um, Flo Longhorn writes about the, I think she said to had, she came up with 21 reference points that somebody with a complex disability might need in order to be able to understand that a ball was a ball. And that's because they're working through a very complicated brain that's there I was going to say it's there to confuse them. They're, they're using the bits of the brain that they can. If you have less access to information, then you need more information from your access points. You, you can feel that yourself. If I were to blindfold you, you would suddenly want more information from your tactile sense. So it's important to you when you're missing bits or when there's something that's confusing you that you need more. And so for those people to be able to focus on something, they would need more from that experience. So they might need to be able to see it, but they might also need to be able to hear it and to touch it. And what you will find is that when you create focus, quite often people seek even more. So you might give somebody an object to touch and they might lift it up to their mouth so that they can touch it here. And people think, oh, you know, they're trying to eat it. And obviously you don't want people eating things that are dangerous to them. But actually it's a very sensible thing to do from a tactile point of view because your lips are so sensitive. There's so many nerve endings here. So if I want to know about this thing, you're telling me about this thing. You're saying, here's this touch experience from a, from a long time ago. Here's this amazing thing that people hundreds of years ago touched and you can touch it too. And I go, yeah, I want to touch it too. I, I want to touch it. I want to feel it. That's my interest and engagement in it. Um, I saw a brief, beautiful example of this once. Um, so that's an example of somebody with a complex disability, but it could also be true of super able people as well. So I saw a beautiful example once of a um, young man who was a maths protege, who's a mathematical genius. And he was revising for his maths exam. I can't remember how old he was or you know, what the exam was that he was doing. He was probably like 10 and about to sit the Oxford entrance exam, something like that. 
And he was rising by running around a field, solving his math problems whilst he was running around a field. And they said to him, well, why are you running around a field? How does the field help you do your maths? And he said, oh, he said, the maths isn't quite enough for my brain. It needs more. And if I run around, that gives it more. And then I can concentrate on my maths. But if I just sat still, that bit of my brain that I'm not using, because the maths isn't big enough to fill my whole brain, I've still got this other bit of brain that wants to do stuff, it would try and do something else, and that would pull me away from my maths. So if I give that other bit of my brain something to do, like running around, then I can concentrate wholly on my maths. So it's there's a relevance there across the ability spectrum. And it's also the same in the flip side. So those are examples of people who need more stimulation in order to be able to focus. You will also find people who need less stimulation in order to be able to focus. So at a kind of very relatable standard, have you ever switched the radio off because you were trying to concentrate or turned off your music or told somebody, shush, I'm just trying to think about this. What you're doing is you're eliminating one source of sensory stimulation so that you can focus your mind and concentrate on meaning. And to take you to the other end of that scale, there's research that shows that some people have brains with a limited capacity. We all have brains with a limited capacity. My brain has a limited capacity. I have to stand still if I want to send a text message. I can't walk and text at the same time. We're all much more limited than I think we are. But for some people, if you're working with a complicated brain, that brain may have to make a choice between which source of information it processes. Am I going to look or am I going to listen? Am I going to touch or am I going to smell? And it might only be able to process one at a time. And so if you want somebody to touch that amazing object, you might have to stop talking about it so that there's not the sound interference, so that they can you enable that ability to focus and concentrate and enjoy. So consider the skills that people use in your setting and provide physical and sensory support for them to use them to the best of their abilities. In this film, we're going to be thinking about how different sensory capacities and processing affect people's sensory access to your experience, event, building, topic, whatever it is. Um, in general, all of our sensory abilities are different. We all have different levels of sight, different levels of hearing. We all have different sensory preferences. We also generally don't respect this. So we will decide, oh, that's too loud for me. This music is too loud. You know, the lights are too bright, the lights are too dark. The only place we're only good at it as a general population is food. We don't automatically presume that everybody will like the same taste experiences as we like. So a lot of what you need to be doing is thinking about individual people's preferences and abilities and disabilities and working out how you're going to adapt around those things. But you also have to work in generalities as well, don't you? Because this is the practical, this is the real world. And so you might want to know, well, what colour should I paint the wall? And what music is best to play? You know, I've got... If you are the theatre, if you are the heritage sector, you have to make a choice somewhere and that's your sort of start point and then you adapt from it. So what we're looking for is the most accessible start point, the best guess, the one that's probably going to work for the most people and then work out ways to flex from there. And so I'm just going to give you a very quick run through of the sensory systems and what you might choose ever so quick. If you want more information about this sort of thing, um, my book, Sensory Being for Sensory Beings, is useful with that regard because each chapter is about a different sensory system and the course Develop Your Sensory Lexiconry is also useful. And there's lots and lots of other places of information aside from me. If you look up um, the guidance by specific organisations that cater for sensory impairments, so if you look up an organisation that caters for visual impairment, organisation that caters for auditory impairment, then you'll get much, much more detailed guidance. And you definitely should do that. You know, don't just, these are just little films to get you thinking. These are not everything you need to know, not by a long shot. But in terms of sight, you're probably looking at natural tones. You know, our senses are 
wired into us. They're part of our evolutionary makeup. And in evolutionary terms, we've been living in these concrete boxes for the blink of an eye. Our eyes are used to the natural world, to the earth colours, to the grass greens, to the sky blues. Those are the colour tones that you're looking for if you want an easy ride on your eyes. And you also might be interested in sort of warm, pinky, red tones because vision becomes active in the womb. And so we all had an experience of seeing a pinky sort of world and it was a nice, safe place. Sound wise, white noise sounds, natural sounds are generally calming and you can find them in a variety of formats. Touch, it's nice to have good, solid information to orientate yourself. So something that has a strong tactile appeal, something that's maybe a bit rough or a bit, you know, it's got a bit of texture to it because that lets you know that you're here, that connects you to your touch. It, it sort of anchors you to this present moment, to this place. So that's, that's a good reassuring thing. Um, taste, everybody has a sweet tooth. We really do. So sweet flavours are always going to be a winner. And for smells, you're looking at things that are calming. And those are the heavy base note smells. So things like chamomile and lavender are generally going to be a reassuring and pleasant experience for people. But generalities don't work. But those are the generalities for if, if you need to use them for pragmatic reasons. We've got to think about these differences. You might have heard of people being sensory seekers, people who need more sensory information from the world than the world generally provides. And that's not a blanket thing. You can seek out information in one sense and want less of it in another sense. And one day you might seek it for one sense and one day you might seek it for another sense. So it, so it changes. But there are people who need more. From stimulation and the flip side is that there are people who need less and then you might encounter somebody who seems to be both you think well what? <laughs> make your mind up which one are you I'm trying to help you here and um, what's happening is if you imagine your senses have volume controls on them what your body needs is to have sense organs that pick up the information and feed it to the brain and it hits the brain at a level that the brain can access. So if I'm trying to access, I've said volume control, so the obvious example is to do with sound. If I'm trying to access a sound experience, I need my ears to pick it up. Once my ears have picked it up, if it's too loud, if it's shouting at me, I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to be dealing with it shouting at me. I'm not going to be taking in the information. And likewise, if it's too quiet, I'm going to be struggling to hear it. And that's going, that struggle is going to detract from my ability to hear the, my, I have a six year old son as well as the little baby. And he is super proud of having the, I have the quietest whisper in my class, mommy. And then he whispers, like, I can't hear you. It's not a whisper. If I can't hear it, it's just, you might as well just not talk. To be a whisper, I, I, this is a conversation I'm having a lot lately. So perhaps I shouldn't have it in public. Um, <laughs> But you get what I mean. If the sound hits you at the right level, you will have set this video to play at a volume that you find pleasant to process. If it was too loud, part of your concentration goes on it being too loud. And if it's too quiet, part of your concentration goes on it being too quiet. So it's a Goldilocks scenario. People want it just right. And our senses have these volume controls on. And for some people, their volume controls don't work properly or their ability to use them isn't fully developed yet. And so what you have is somebody trying to tune in, but they go too far one way, and then they come too far back the other way. And so they flip between needing more and needing less. And that can be um, because they haven't developed the skill of controlling that volume control yet, or it can be because there's a physiological problem in their brain that that control is broken. It's, it's no matter how much they practice using it, it's never going to work properly. So how can we be responsive to different needs? Because there's so many permutations. What can you do? And practically, because we can only be practical here, we, it, it has to be a pragmatic approach. We haven't got magic wands to be able to get it exactly right for everybody. But what we want to be able to do is be responsive. So if somebody ha knows that they tend to need more stimulation or they tend to need less stimulation, 
could we suggest um, zones within our environment? You know, if you're looking for a bit more stimulation, head up to, you know, deck two, where there's lights and flashes and bangs and whizzes and pops. And if you're looking for a little bit less stimulation, well, we recommend deck three, where we've got our library and our chill out space. So people can take themselves to where they feel at ease. If you're in the classroom, are there different contrasting places within your classroom so that your students can find a place that suits them? Could you offer resources to people to help them to tune to adjust their sensory input? So I've seen places have backpacks that have um, resources in that can offer more stimulation or resources in that can help you restrict the stimulation that you get. So, you know, sound cancelling headphones or dark glasses, something like that. Can you give people information ahead of time so that they can plan routes around your environment that are supportive to their needs? And one question I get asked a lot when I speak to heritage workers is, we want to be inclusive like this, but how do, how do we say it? You know, do we say on our website that this is for disabled people? Do we say this is for autistic people? Do we? And it's very complicated, isn't it? Because yes, this might be very suitable to autistic people, but not all autistic people. There will be some autistic people who want, there's lots of quiet hours at the moment, not all autistic people want quiet some of them want loud you know it's not generally speaking most are very happy with quiet but not all and also you know the person who's got a really bad hangover also wants quiet um the lady with dementia whose brain is very muddled and confused finds the loud very distressing she also wants quiet and so what i would advise is rather than trying to describe the demographic describe the provision we provide, you know, sensory calm spaces. We have created, this is what's here. Is it useful to you? This is what's on offer. These are the resources that we have. If it's useful to you, you're welcome to use it. And actually, there's a challenge, isn't it? Because sometimes these resources are very, um, the, the fun, it's normally a funding problem. They were funded for a particular demographic and so they're for including that demographic but include in including that demographic we exclude other demographics like they used it and it wasn't for them and actually if we are being inclusive if you have a need then we want to provide for it and we don't care whether you've had that need you know rubber stamped by a top level professional or whether it's just a need that you have for today yourself if we are welcoming and including you, then we want to include everybody. I hope you've enjoyed these films and enjoyed asking the questions and contemplating the things that we've talked about. We've talked about how sensory experience can give cognitive accessibility to meaning. We've talked about how backgrounding the sensory experiences we offer can raise them up or destroy them. We've talked about creating access to, to experience by sequencing that experience and repeating that experience. And we've talked about um, accessibility in terms of abilities, that once somebody is in a place, we want them to be as able as they can be. And we've thought about sensory differences. And I ended the last film by saying we want to include everybody. And actually that everybody includes you. And if I were to do another film, it would be about mental health. Because a connection with our sensory worlds promotes mental health for all people, regardless of ability, disability or neurodivergence. And I hope as you've thought about the topics in these films and maybe done a little bit of exploring, you have connected with your own senses at a greater level because we are people, we are human, we are flesh and bone and blood and bodies. And when we feel, when we touch, when we smell, we take ourselves out of our headspace and we are very good at priding intellect. We rate intellect enormously highly. We, we measure people on intellect. We, we sort of award points in life for being clever. And it, that's just one measure, isn't it? There's plenty of clever people who are very frightened and very distressed. And there's plenty of people who would not be described as clever, who lead very joyful lives. 
And I sometimes wonder whether we've got the measure wrong. You know, being connected to a sensory moment counts for an enormous amount. If you're worried, if you're, I'm going back to the heritage worker because the heritage worker brought me to these films. If you're worried that the meaning is not being conveyed, stop worrying. Just curate one beautiful sensory moment and share it with somebody. Because in that moment, there is meaning. And in that moment, there is connection. If you share that moment with somebody, you're there in that moment and they're there in that moment. And there is self. You know, because when you touch something, you know that it's there and you know that you're there. And that embodiment of self is really, really good for mental health. And so I hope that you will seek to develop sensory accessibility in your practice, to use sensory engagement strategies, to include people, to invite people in, to engage people, all people and you. I hope you benefit from it too. Thank you ever so much for sharing the workshop with me. All the best.